Hello everybody and welcome once again to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley with you once again. So uh, yeah, I said I was probably going to take a break, but I went ahead and fit some more stuff in and got really excited about them and that lasted a little while and while my excitement was fresh, I decided to take a break and uh, read some Malazan stuff, which is time consuming because they're gigantic and uh, not really skimmable for me because I enjoy them so much, so that's good. But uh, I am taking a break now, but I'm gonna come back and review this stuff in the uh, realm setting that I've read. Since then, we're still in 1368, the year that will never ever end, it feels like. Let's go ahead and end out a couple of, uh, of series. I, I'm pretty sure this is the fourth in the Finder Stone series. Before that we had the Trilogy. No, this is the fifth. We had the Trilogy, then we had uh, Masquerades, and now we have Finder's Bane. Finder's Bane mostly is about Finder as a new god and his followers. <laughs> Just barely the S on there. I think there are two. Mostly we focus on Joel, who is a uh, priest of Finder, or, or a, a paladin of Finder, a bard of Finder, whatever, a bard of Finder. Uh, yeah, um, uh, a follower of Finder. And, you know, I mean, things get always a little wiggy-wiggy in here because it's like he gets power from Finder even though he's technically a bard, etc, etc, etc. I don't know if he would technically be multiclassed or what. So this is pretty cool and, and I enjoyed the way that they uh, continued the story without necessarily referring uh, to the other stuff directly. Like Alias is mentioned a couple of times because they go to the Lost Vale where uh, she's mentioned going before where... Uh, Dragon Bait's kind are, and we see a couple of uh, minor characters from uh, earlier books, but like Olive isn't here, Alias isn't here, Dragon Bait isn't here. I really like that these guys are able to do a uh, uh, s uh, stuff in this series without necessarily including Alias. Like, for instance, Masquerades appears to be the last time we ever see Alias and Dragon Bait, which again makes it frustrating that they didn't go ahead and kill at least one of them off in that, because that would have been shocking, I think, and uh, surprising, but in this series it feels like they could get away with that. Of course, I assume everybody's dead now because of the Spell Plague. Even more so than the Spell Plague, the hundred year jump <laughs> that took place. But, who knows, uh, from little things that I've seen, it sounds like Entreri is still around, and it's like, Jesus, man, what, I mean, is he just hacking on his deathbed? That's what he does? Like, maybe that's what Gauntlegrim is about. <laughs> it's like Drizzt hanging out up north, and uh, Entreri hacks up some blood every few chapters. Woo! So what was kind of frustrating about this book is uh, the bits with... Finder are pretty much exactly what you would expect. There's nothing really interesting or shocking there. In fact, uh, he's disguised as a different character through the first third or so of the book, and once he's revealed, it's like, well, of course, obviously. I, you know, it, it, there's just nothing surprising when it comes to him. The other characters are, however, interesting enough to keep this book entertaining. An odd trend starts with this book, and I'm assuming it's because Planescape must have been hitting shelves around this time, uh, apparently along with Spelljammer, though this is the only book I think that outrightly uses Spelljamming stuff as part of its plot, but this one uses both Spelljamming stuff and uh, Planescape stuff. In fact, I'd say over half the book takes place uh, in, not necessarily in Sigil itself, but Sigil in its outlying environs. Also, everybody here loves Mind Flayers. Everybody just thinks Mind Flayers are the most awesome thing ever. And I gotta say, Eleuthids are pretty damn cool. So I can't argue much with that, but this uh, begins or continues the uh, trend of using Eleuthids to be just awesome. The stuff in Sigil is only problematic because it's like, well, gods aren't allowed there, but Finder kind of sort of does a Doctor Who fob watch thing and becomes fully human, except he's still kind of a god and blah, 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 blah. A lot of the settings are, are interesting. The different places they go are intriguing and, and interesting. And in fact, the way that this ends, like in the uh, celestial sphere or whatever it is, like the, the, the uh, uh, climax of this book takes place floating on Bane's corpse. I mean, <laughs> this feels like one of the Avatar trilogy books. This feels that big and this important, except for the fact that in the end, really absolutely nothing changes. So that's a little frustrating, but the kind of uh, thrust of the plot of the book is uh, bad guys are trying to resurrect Bane. 
and it's kind of like they have Finder, who's still pretty weak and young at this point. Uh, they have his balls in a vice, pretty much. So it's like, will he go along with it or not? And will his followers still accept him if he does? As you might have noticed by the fact that Bane doesn't get resurrected this way. I think they did resurrect him later, but I'm not sure how. But it doesn't happen in this book, so obviously the answer is he doesn't go along with it. But it's very climactic, very exciting, very uh, realms and beyond hopping. I mean, we're on a spell jamming ship for a while, though we don't really use that to spell jam it pretty much just uh is the way they get into the sigil area like i don't i don't know what that area is called that plane or whatever that demi plane that sigil's part of we go to sigil we get to see sigil uh just uh, I, this is almost a travelogue of sorts which i'm okay with uh i, I guess it kind of makes one wonder is this a realms book in the final analysis, and we'll have to ask that even more about the next book, book six um, in the uh, Finderstone stuff. But at least for this one, I, I think, yeah, it's still a, a realms book. It works as a realms book. I really enjoyed it. I, it, it's, it, it, there's nothing like amazing in it, but by the end you feel like, wow, we really did see a lot of stuff uh, that we haven't seen before, learn a lot of things that we haven't learned before, and it was entertainingly written, which is usually the case with Grub and Novak, for me at least. What's strange is book six, Tamora's Luck. I just couldn't get into this at all. It's weird because it pretty much uh, starts right where Finder's Bane left off, as you can tell, since they're both in the same year, at dealing with the same stuff, I think this one takes entirely place in Sigil uh, and kind of the realms of the gods because it revolves around a plot of the gods. Like one of the, basically, it, it like the entire like linchpin upon which the plot holds is like this one god tries to get lucky. I'm trying to remember their names. It's uh, like Lethander and the el an elf chick? I, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, but uh, he's like trying to get lucky and, and she's like, you know, hey, go ask somebody else. And he's like, well, the last hot chick I was banging was dead. And she's like, well, go try to bring her back to life or something. And essentially he does. Like that's the entire plot thrust of the book is like him trying to get lucky and He's like, well, I might as well try to resurrect some goddess from the dead. Like, it just, it, it didn't really seem like it made sense, and it was boring, and it's frustrating because, like, Joel, who I really liked in Finder's Bane, just seems dull in this book, and so does everybody else. I didn't get very far before I just started skimming. I, I, I went ahead and skimmed this one simply because I was like, well, I think this is the last one of the series. I don't want to completely ignore it want to at least see where it goes. Sadly, it wasn't anywhere very interesting. So, yeah, that one is just skippable. I didn't see that anything really happened or came out of it. Like, the ending of Finder's Bane is so epic and, and uh, awe-inspiring, and even though nothing happens, you feel like a lot of things happen. This one's just kind of people mucking about and not doing anything. That's really kind of the end goal of it, I think. Let's go ahead and talk about Dream Spheres now. Elaine Cunningham's uh, fifth, I think it's the fifth one in uh, this series. The, uh, oh god, I can never remember. It's it's like, it's not Stong Songs and Starlight, is it? That's, that's the, I, I don't know, Shadows and Starlight is her, dr her drow one, and uh, this one is Songs and Spells? I don't know. Something like that. In any case, uh, I was really, really hoping that I would like this one as much as Elf Song, which is the one book out of there I liked, but I loved that one. And I'll go ahead and say, I did like this one, not as much as Elf Song, but I did enjoy it. There was not enough Blackstaff in it for me, but I could probably say that about anything, though I'm excited to get to the book Blackstaff, <laughs> because, assumedly, that's going to have a lot of Blackstaff in it. This one, it, it does have a... I'm no good with the elf names because they're long enough that I just kind of, like, see them on sight. I don't... I never, like, pronounce them in my head, but, like, Elaith, is that right? Uh, the kind of semi-evil, always-on-the-cusp anti-hero elf who named Danilo Elf Friend at one point. There's a, a good amount with him, and I like him a lot. I like Danilo a lot, and Erlen's in here... But you know what? Erlen is, like, handled maturely in, in this novel. It's crazy, and it's out of the blue, and it totally works. This novel is, in many ways, about will they or won't they when it comes to Danilo and Erlen. It's kind of about them being like, okay, look, we've got all these problems with our relationship, but do we both want it? Is it, bo is it worth it to both of us? And what are we going to do about it? 
And they, they do something about it, and I really, really enjoyed seeing this handled in a way that wasn't kind of ongoing melodrama BS, you know? It wasn't like, oh, they start to talk about it, and then she gets called away by the elves, and oh, he starts to talk about it, and oh, da 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 da, -da this comes out. This has a lot of stuff in it. I mean, there's stuff about Danilo's family, uh, both his heritage and dealing with family members. Erlen's background, all just all sorts of stuff coming into play, and uh, it, it, it is mostly focused on Danilo and Erlen, but it does still have that kind of feel of the entire like cast of Waterdeep, if you will, is involved in some sort of way. Even Bronwyn from uh, from I think the last one is involved, not a lot, but she's in there. In the end, I was a little bit frustrated that this book didn't do more. For instance, the Dream Spheres, <laughs> which, you know, is the title of the book, they never really go anywhere or do anything. Like, it doesn't... Uh, they're so inconsequential, they should have been called the uh, MacGuffin Spheres. I don't even remember what happens to Isabeau. I mean, that's how kind of unimportant she is overall, even though she kind of sort of drives, like, the second act in a lot of ways. Uh, there's some frustrating things about it, some good things about it some not so great things about it. The worst thing about this book was the ending. Simply because we get a conclusion, or we get closure for the Danilo and Erlen storyline, which I enjoyed. And, and I mean, we get closure on the Dream Sphere storyline. It's nothing amazing, but it's there. But it's kind of like, through the whole thing, there's all this foreboding that, like, um... Danilo and Erlen, like, becoming an item and saying, for real, we are going to do this, will bring rack and ruin to one of them at least, if not both of them. And that never really happens. I mean, kind of in the end, it's like, eh, well, all right, we'll just work this out. It's cool. Which is maybe the point that Cunningham was going for here, that, you know, things are never as bad as you think they're going to be. But it felt anticlimactic. And it felt as if the book was begging for something to happen and to see how they dealt with it. I, I wanted to see tragedy strike one of them and them overcome it. You know, I didn't want an unhappy ending for them, but I wanted to see them have to struggle for it. And instead it's kind of like, well, they go through some sewers and fight some Tren and then they're all good. It's cool. Even Alaith is happier. There's some really good moments in it, but not as good as Elf Song. Definitely enjoyable, though. A good end of the series. I'm going to stop there for now. Really excited about the next one. I might go ahead and record it now uh, simply because I've got a couple of great things to talk about. A couple of snoozers to talk about as well. But I'm excited to get there. Hope you all are too. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.